Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a very special Wire Live on International Women's Day 2021. Uh, I'm fortunate enough today to be joined by a panel of three amazing women who happen to work in the technology space. So today we have Amy Wood, who is a Partner Development Manager at Microsoft, Puff Story, who is co-founder of Tech for Good Agency Three Sided Cube, and Jen Calland, who is a Platform Engineer at Cloud Technology Solutions. Welcome, ladies. The reason we wanted to run this panel today was that we're in a situation where technology has never been more important to our society, and yet the representation of women has not only stalled, it's going backwards. I read a McKinsey study from 2018 that showed that over the last 25 years, the percentage of women in computer positions in the US has gone down rather than up. The percentage of women of colour taking computer science degrees has declined. Also, in the context of COVID, we've seen a lot of the gender equality gains by women in the workplace go backwards as they've had to step out for default assumptions around they would take care of the additional caring responsibilities for children coming out of school. And also a lot of the jobs and the sectors they work in being hardly hit by COVID. So as we sit here on a day where we want to celebrate the amazing achievements of women and push for greater equality, we you know, you could be forgiven for thinking the picture might look a little bit bleak. However, I think what we'll hopefully get to by the end of our time together today is a real sense of the possibility that exists, especially in the technology sector. The technology sector is a boom sector in our economy. It has really strong wage growth, which is why not only from a moral point of view, but from an economic point of view, we need more women to get into this sector. By getting into this sector, when women can give themselves the financial security they need to live fulfilling and safe lives. Also, as tech's so important in shaping our society today, we need women to have seats at the table. The default assumption in any design has been male for too long. We need women in the room to change that conversation. And also for those people thinking about shareholder value, study after study has shown that a lack of diversity in any boardroom, in any team, particularly in tech, leads to huge opportunity cost. Diverse teams are more creative, they're more innovative, and they're more profitable. Three things which are hugely important to the tech sector. So if the moral argument wasn't enough, we've got some pretty convincing economic arguments as well as to why everyone needs to get more women into tech. So without further ado, I'd like to invite each of the three panelists to give us a little bit of a background around their career, how they ended up working in tech and what they love about it. So Amy, can I start with you, please? Yeah, of course. Hi, everybody, and happy International Women's Day. Um, my career uh, at the moment is pretty short. Uh, I'm still pretty young. So I originally um, started university doing a law degree, and I was adamant that that is where I wanted to sit. I was pursuing it pretty hard, uh, doing lots of competitions around interviewing and had my heart set on becoming a solicitor. The more and more work experience I did, I felt like something wasn't right, that I just wasn't enjoying it. And we work for far too long, far too many hours to not enjoy something um, that we do. So I was lucky enough to be able to take a placement in my university degree between my second and final year. And I was just scrolling, you know, typical, didn't really know what I wanted to do, wasn't going to use my degree. So I was really at my wit's end, uh, shall we say, and I was seeing what placement opportunities, um, and I'll be honest, offered a salary because a lot of uh, law placements didn't offer any um, reimbursement on your wage. And I knew that I wasn't in a financial position to be able to take no money for a year. Uh, so I was scrolling and I stumbled across Microsoft and they offered a really good competitive wage. And I thought, you know what, this is a name I've heard of, um, pretty confident in what they do. Uh, so I'll apply and see if I get anywhere. Uh, I applied and got through the various stages, the video interviews, uh, the weird one sided question interviews that they like to do uh, where you're essentially answering yourself, which is a bit bizarre and you know made it to the assessment center and 
finally got uh, got the job as a junior account manager in the central government team in our public sector. This opened my eyes. It, I, you know, I was under a female manager who was super motivational. She now leads um, our women at Microsoft team and she was really supportive and really pushed me and made, allowed me to do things that were completely outside of my comfort zone, but also not stereotypically an intern, you know, I wasn't making coffees or, pho you know, photocopying. I was, you know, at Downing Street uh, doing pitches on our Teams technology and, it, you know, showcasing our Surface Hub, uh, the likes of Buckingham Palace, which was insane. Um, and I kind of felt like I finally belonged somewhere and it was nice to see that path. So once I finished my placement, uh, I went back to uni and, you know, did the old slog, had to do all my law exams, which, you know, I thankfully passed and, you know, got a really good 2-1. Um, and I was actually invited back to Microsoft to the graduate program, where I landed my position as a partner development manager, which is where I sit now. Uh, I've looked after various partners, um, including Wirehive, who sit in my patch. And yeah, I thoroughly enjoy it. I get to go out and build and help transform businesses you know, and digitally, yeah, digitally transform our customers and make life better. So yeah, that's where um, I started and that's where I'm sat today. Brilliant, thank you, Amy. Sounds like you've really found a, a passion and a cause as well as a great career at Microsoft. Um, so Puff, uh, you've gone down the entrepreneur route. Perhaps you tell us a little bit about how you ended up co-founding a tech for good agency. Absolutely, absolutely. So my background um, isn't in tech, it's actually in advertising and marketing. Um, so I graduated Bournemouth University um, in advertising and marketing, and I was lucky enough to go straight into a job um, at a large media agency in London. Um, did that for six, seven years, loved it, was amazing, made so many friends, but I think I got to a point where I kind of wanted more to life. Um, you know, I was spending lots and lots of time um, doing something that I wasn't quite sure I believed in. It wasn't kind of helping people. It was probably, um, I kind of felt like I'd sold my soul to the devil, to put it bluntly, which isn't a good place um, to be. So, I um, I decided that I would relocate from London back to Bournemouth, which is where I was at uni, and I um, I, I kind of went into tech. I went to um, a, a web design and development agency called Red Web um, and started learning um, how people design and build websites, which, you know, this was probably nine, ten, actually probably longer um, probably longer <laughs> oh gosh I don't want don't like to say the numbers and yeah it was a really steep learning curve but I absolutely loved it um but at that point in time I was um engaged I got married um and I actually um I fell pregnant and uh, with my first child um and um you know, I met a guy called Duncan Cook, who's the founder of Three Sided Cube in the UK. And we kind of, you know, we had really good chemistry. I loved what he was doing. Um, but the crazy thing is, is he'd never worked in an agency before, whereas my background was just all agencies. That's all I'd ever known in terms of my career at that point in time. And Duncan had these grand visions of building a building an agency, but he'd never been in one, which kind of, I was really intrigued by that. Um, so he, he offered me this position where it was basically, it was, there was flexible working involved, which, you know, eight, nine years ago just didn't exist. Or, I, or if I, if it did, it mean, it meant that I would have to take a step back in my career. And I just was kind of like, okay, so, I took a job with Duncan. Um, we basically started building the UK agency together um, and we started focusing in on um, our mission, which is um, to build tech for good to change millions of lives for the better. And I think 
at that point in time and still next still to this day it's definitely something that we can get behind the whole team get behind and it actually started exciting me that we were using technology to make a positive difference to people um which was really exciting but i think the the from a selfish point of view i could do all of that but i could still do it on a part-time basis so i was working that around being a mum and being a wife and you know looking after the house um which was great i'd never had that opportunity before so i found this whole it just was so flexible um and you know fast forward eight years i've now co-founded the us side of the business with duncan um which is amazing um we're in growth uh, we have a team of around 45 people here in the uk and we're looking to to grow quite quickly in the us so it's quite exciting i'm not part-time anymore it is a full-time role but i have managed to have another child so i've got two two girls now um and i think it's important to have female role models um that can show you that you can have children if you want children and still have a really successful career um so that's a little bit about my story that's brilliant thank you puff really inspiring and i think a really important message on a couple of points around the promise and ability of tech to power this flexible work environment and also the importance of role models which i think we'll probably come back to a bit later on uh, Jen, can you give us a bit about your story and how you uh, ended up working in tech? Sure. Um, I've been in tech since the 1990s in the tech industry in, in various forms. Uh, basically, I was fortunate enough as a child to have a computer in the house. And um, later on as a hobby, one of my hobbies anyways, is actually building desktop systems uh, from scratch. And so uh, basically, I was a uni stopout unfortunately, but when I went and joined the job market, it was as a contractor and it was usually like administrative assistant type positions, if you know what I mean. But uh, people quickly caught on, hey, this girl knows a thing or two about computers. Maybe we can put her on this project or that project. And each of those projects ended up uh, increasingly more technical. And um, I landed a... Uh, <laughs> a contract position at Siemens and uh, in their finance department as an administrative assistant. Uh, but the uh, manager of the finance group talked to her husband who was also working for the company but over in R&D and said, hey, I've got a girl here who knows a thing or two about computers. And so I went to interview with him and was invited to join the uh, capital and asset management team. And basically what that team did was um, we would work with our tech ops group. We would work with our vendors. We would work with our customers to come up with a standardized um, platform upon which to use SIEM and PLM software's various software packages. And um, this is before cloud and uh, to build out, you know, capital, you know, budgets, um, the processes around it, everything else were just massive. A lot of planning, a lot of footwork, that sort of thing. And my boss had tasked me with the job of developing a web application that would automate a lot of, a lot of those um, processes, which I was able to accomplish very successfully to the point where other tools such as a travel request tool and a staffing request tool were also kind of bolted into the original uh, backbone of, of the uh, web app that I built. At any rate, um, I moved on from Siemens because I, I fell in love with an Englishman and moved over to England. And uh, here, um, I went to work for a uh, health food uh, startup, which uh, basically they they had just started selling products on the internet, but really had some had a poor website and had some poor uh, back office processes and everything. And so. Um, I managed to uh, get them back on track as far as you know a new website built from the ground up that integrated with um, processes in the back office that were all automated and everything basically i took a look at how amazon did things and repeated a lot of that because there's no use reinventing the wheel and um, this was at the start of the 2008 recession and by 2010 this business that had been running in the red 
uh, grossed over two billion in sales that year, I think. So um, with productivity, um, uh, with the productivity in increases and that sort of thing, uh, just did a tremendous job for this business, making it a successful business. After that, I went on uh, maternity leave, and that maternity leave ended up being much longer than I anticipated. But uh, a couple of years back, um, I just made the decision that I wanted to go back to work and I wanted to be back in tech. How do I get there? And, you know, because I had a lot of experience, but with the gap, nobody really wanted to talk to me. So I managed to enroll in a couple of boot camps. Uh, one was uh, Tech Up Women. I was one of the first 100 graduates there. And then I moved on to Tech Returners, who had more of a Manchester focus, completed their boot camp. And uh, some representatives from CTS had um, gone to see, you know, what the results of uh, our boot camp at Tech Returners was and asked me to interview as part of their graduate program. And uh, they hired me last September. So I was able to obtain a tech job that gives me a lot of flexibility because now I'm mom of two and a parent carer as well. Um, but I'm able to engage in work, be productive, doing something I love anyways, and um, being successful at it all during a pandemic. So that's about all I have to say on that for now. Thanks. <laughs> wow. What a great story, Jen. Um, Again, you, you covered so many themes, I think, um, is what makes tech amazing to work in and why it's so important that we solve this uh, lack of rep representation of women in the sector as well, because it has the potential to be so empowering in terms of improving gender equality across society. Um, I think we've seen women who can keep working are those who are in positions where they're fortunate enough to be able to work from home. Um, not saying it's uh, there aren't additional problems around assumptions about primary caring and that sort of thing, but you know where women have really suffered are those who are people in roles that are either increasingly automated or the hospitality sector, the leisure sector, uh, those sort of sectors where uh, have been really badly hit by COVID. So um, I think you've, your story definitely taps into some key themes um, around why this is so important. Right, so thanks for those intros, everyone. Um, what I thought it would be good just to start off with, um, you know, perhaps um, for some younger people listening or people who don't work in tech, you know, it kind of seems obvious to us because we're in it, but what does the tech sector have to offer women? Why, why should women consider a career in the tech sector? Um, Amy, would you like to have a go at answering this first from your perspective? Yeah, of course. Um, I think it, I think it's a key um, just to point out, um, especially if there are younger people watching and thinking about applying, you don't have to be super technical to join the tech industry. Um, I am not, I do not come from a technical background. I do not sit in a technical role as such. Um, so, you know, we're not all sitting there coding uh, day in, day out and um, Put my hand up now i do not know how to code um and i'm still doing pretty well at microsoft so i think gives you a big opportunity to learn and grow and delve into skills that you might not have necessarily thought were open to you um i was not very good at science or maths at uh, school but you know coming in and learning on the job and having hands-on experience is very different to a classroom environment and you can pick up those skills as you learn and grow and really grow into yourself um, and become you know technical uh, I think I think the flexible working again I think we've touched on is amazing and not only if you've got children but for your mental health and this year has been particularly difficult uh, trapped in a room you know and looking at your computer screen and if you don't have that flexibility to be able to walk away from your screen for an hour and just switch off and just be at one with yourself, um, I think that could be really detrimental to your productivity. Um, so I think flexible working is a big one. Um, societies, um, especially, you know, even getting invited to do panels like this, you know, that doesn't happen in every industry. So being given that voice and being able to join and talk about your experiences with other women is really powerful and it's really important, um, especially looking for role models because it's not always 
open and it's not always, you know, right there in front of you and obvious that women sit in these positions, especially at school. And if you think of a technical person, you're likely to think that it's a man um, and that's just the way it's been. And you kind of accept it at school, but actually meeting people and hearing their experiences, you think, oh yeah, I can do that. Um, so I think that's a massive thing and strong progression. There's so many roles and so many avenues that you can go into that you can have five different careers and in the same industry, which is amazing. You know, it's not like when I sat in law that I could be a solicitor or a barrister and that was kind of the two avenues I could go into. Uh, there's just so many opportunities and so many different paths that you can take uh, within the same company or, you know, within the same industry. Brilliant. Thanks, Amy. I think the school point's really interesting. I was reading a um, piece of research by PwC uh, the other week, and it um, says a lot of the problems are that perception that w women don't think about going to technology because they perceive that it is a very male dominated and the lack of role models just reinforces that perception so we're in this vicious circle where it's seen as not for girls and the lack of prominent female role models just reinforces it so um, I think we've got a lot of work to do around there. Um, Puff perhaps you could tell us from your point of view um, apart from sort of the, the flexibility you've already mentioned what do you think the tech sector has to offer women across the spectrum? So I would agree and echo all of Amy's points because they're fantastic points. Um, but, you know, I guess for me, I, you know, I'm not overly technical, but what I love about being in the tech sector is I feel like I'm always learning. So I'm always learning something new, whether it's, you know, related to the technical side of the, of the business or whether or not it's related to the people side of the business. I'm always learning. And I think being in an environment where, everyone will tell you that, that they're also always learning you know they might be experts at what they do but doesn't mean that they're not learning every day themselves and I think that's what's wonderful about being in tech is that you know certainly in our in our um, business anyway you know we we all kind of are honest and say look we're all we're all going to be learning things on this journey and that's okay and I think you know there's something around confidence there. I don't think if you'd have asked me, you know, 15, 20 years ago, would I see myself in tech? I'd have probably said no, because I wasn't confident enough to be able to say, yeah, I, I know loads about tech and I can do this. You know, I just, that's not me. And I, you know, it's really sad to say this, but I think that's probably how a lot of women feel. Um, but I think, you know that's fine and that's okay but none of us you know it's claim that we know everything even though we do work in tech and I think I think that's a good thing um and Amy touched on it earlier as well it's the infinite opportunities so many opportunities and um I think the more people I meet the more I realize oh my gosh there's just so many things that you could do you could you know be an entrepreneur you could start your own business you could go and work for a large organization like Microsoft you could you know work for a small tech startup there's lots of different avenues lots of different routes as well as different positions so you could be a developer you could be a designer you could you know be a client strategist you could like there's lots of different roles there's just so many opportunities so I think before writing anything off you know do a bit of research see what roles are out there and you know more importantly go and speak to those people um because you know chloe you you mentioned it i think there is or there certainly was when i was growing up a huge lack of female role models in tech that i was aware of um and i think you know, we're slowly seeing that tide change, but I don't know if it's happening quickly enough, um, which is why I'm a massive advocate of, I've got two daughters, so I'm always <laughs> trying to push them out and being like, you can be whatever it is you wanna be, whether it's in tech or, or not in tech. Um, but I, you know, love or pre-COVID going into schools and, and speaking to um, young girls that are, you know, making really important life cho choices at a very early age but I think it's not just relevant for those younger 
children it's you know for women that have perhaps taken a career break whether they've had children or gone traveling or you know they want to change careers i i did i changed from advertising and marketing which is all i'd ever known into tech i started from scratch again i had to start from the beginning but it's not it you know it is scary but it's not it doesn't have to be a bad experience it could be a wonderful experience and i don't think i'd change that I think that's um, you, you made some really, really interesting points there, Puff. And I think there's perhaps I do wonder if it's the age of the industry or I guess from perhaps if you think about parents advising children, what their perception of tech is, do they think it is just, you know, men programming? And so perhaps don't suggest it to their daughters, you know, or I think it's perhaps not understood that it can be a really um huge jump for social mobility in the way that sort of 30 40 years ago it was like oh if you have a bright child push them to be an accountant or a lawyer because that's a profession that gives you security i think um i don't think tech gets talked about in the same way and actually all the data shows it's a huge growth area now and and so i think if if schools don't have that insight and parents don't have that insight, there's there's definitely a role for the sector itself to try and fill that educational gap. Uh, Jen, and apologies, because when you get last, asked last in these uh, situations, quite a few points you probably wanted to make come before, but um, I guess from your point of view, particularly as a tech returner, what do you think the technology sector has to offer women? Well, first off, absolutely all the above. Plus, though, um, there is a lot of recognition, I think, in the industry as uh, far as lack of diversity, both in gender, color of your skin, who you love. Uh, and because of that rec that recognition, that acknowledgement, finally, it seems like uh, folks who are in leadership positions are doing more to promote women and people of color and people of different gender identity or you know, who they love, whatever the case may be, uh, to come to the table and be a part of that decision making, uh, to finally see people in those roles who look like or think like me. Um, so there's been a lot more promotion there within the industry overall. And I think that that's leading to, of course, more lucrative jobs uh, becoming available uh, with an eye on hiring from marginalized communities. And um, I've definitely noticed, you know, that shift in culture, at least where I work at CTS, where there have been a couple of times where I've pulled my line manager aside and said, wow, I don't have to deal with, you know, this social issue or anything like that in the workplace because, you know, it, there's there were, in comparison to working in the 90s in the tech industry, there were a lot of things that women had to put up with as far as like microaggressions or even in inappropriate talk and that sort of thing that's not tolerated anymore. And so it's a safer environment for women or other marginalized peoples to come and work in because that behavior isn't tolerated. And that I think is a huge bonus as far as changing the work culture to be much more inclusive. And then of course, spreading the wealth, you know, a bit as far as like the opportunities and inviting people to the table not just to be heard but to to make the decisions there's been a lot of positive change there thanks jen i think um the diversity inclusion belonging point is um is really important and i think it's quite interesting and, and maybe this is a slightly myopic view because i work in the technology sector but it certainly feels like a lot of the companies who are being very proactive around the diversity, inclusion and belonging debate are technology companies. I know Microsoft, for instance, not only has a great internal program around diversity, but as a Microsoft partner, while Hyper signed the Microsoft partner pledge, and one of the core tenets of that pledge is a commitment to diversity across both gender, uh, ethnicity, sexual orientation, disability. Um, and I think it's interesting to see that 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 tech for good angle um, really coming through and being a real, hopefully a force for good. I mean, obviously, the tech sector does have some bad stories. I think, you know, Ubergate from a few years ago shows that for some women working technology, there was a lot of inappropriate behaviour and a really, really toxic environment, which 
I still think, you know, we're not, we've not seen the full extent of because obviously coming forward with those stories is incredibly, incredibly challenging and not always received with the uh, openness and acceptance perhaps it should be. But I do think since, I, I'm not sure what you guys think, it feels like Uber Me Too, it kind of was like a, a big touchstone moment in the industry. And I think we've seen a lot of change since then. Would, would you agree or disagree with that? <laughs> Thumbs up from Jen. <laughs> I, I would agree. Um, you know, I have, I've only been in tech for 10, just over 10 years, but I would say that when I started out in tech, I probably experienced more, yeah, I, I did experience some really horrible um, um, things, but I, you know, it's not worth the airtime now. And it, I, like, I haven't experienced that stuff for years. And I don't know if it's because I'm in a tech for good bubble or if it's just naturally ha like happened across the industry, but I definitely, I'm definitely seeing signs of improvement for sure. Brilliant, that's really great to hear. Um, so I'm, I think- I'm thinking know, that we're kind of, or go ahead. No, sorry, Jen, please carry on. No, I was just going to comment that I think that it's starting to hit kind of like a critical mass as far as that's concerned. Um, we're seeing more diverse people, you know, in these working spaces and in these leadership positions. And right now is an excellent time for getting on. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think this, this raises an interesting point because I think awareness of the issue has never been higher. And I think I do feel generally commitment to making a change, not just from women who are in these leadership positions but all leaders in this you know allyship is so important to making this change happen quickly and making it stick um it does really feel like there is a genuine commitment to change however the reality is that still the tech sector is hugely male dominated and you know with the old adage of you can't be what you can't see it does cause problems so you know i guess It'd be interested, you know, I guess interesting just for kind of point of view panel and your own perceptions of, you know, why do you think it's so male dominated and, you know, what kind of, I guess, green shoots of diversity are you starting to see uh, when you look around the tech sector? Amy, maybe you can start. Yeah, I think a lot of it um, stems from the application processes and women are known um, to play down their achievements, uh, especially on their CVs and stuff. And I know for a fact I fall, fell victim to looking at a job, you know, posting. And if I don't hit every single one of those criteria, then I just rule myself out. When actually we know that uh, men tend to look at it and if they're missing a few, they'll be like, oh, yeah, I'm sure I can do that. They're a lot more confident and they know that they have still got, you know, in for the job, whereas that hasn't been the case because we don't see enough women in that particular role. So we probably think, oh, if they're if they're in that position, they've probably fulfilled every single, you know, listing and requirement on that job application. So I think it's a confidence thing. And I think the more people we see become successful and the more role models we see emerging, um, we will see that rise in application actually. And actually, you know, being confident in what we can do and it's not, sh it's not showing off, you know, so many, I think what irritates me the most is TV shows and films. You know, if a woman is in a high power position, she is a bit more aggressive, she's direct, people are scared of her. Um, and that just, isn't the case and that's not how you need to be uh, to be in those roles but actually you know there's nothing wrong with being confident in what you can do and believing in yourself uh, you know you have a right to apply for a job and you know speak out um, and actually be like okay I might not fulfill all this but hey I can do this this and this differently so I think it's a it's a bigger issue um, and I think we need to show women that are vulnerable that have had families that you know are not these beasts 
the you know devil wears prada is a classic example um if we you know put it to mainstream films is she, people are scared of her and behind she's actually battling and she the only person she actually connects with is another woman um and that's quite powerful and i i think yeah i think like you said you can't be what you can't see and i think that's the biggest issue um and i think the education piece at school needs to be huge and we need to really be pushing females and you know women to feel empowered to apply for things and push you know be pushed out of their comfort zone and not feeling like they're just going to be rejected or stopped at the first hurdle um so yeah i think i think that's where i stand on that one Oh, you've raised so many brilliant points, Amy. And like you say, these are issues that don't just impact representation of women uh, in technology, but across all industries, especially in leadership positions. And, um, you know, have, can go right back to socialization and uh, prioritization of uh, girls to be nice and conciliatory rather than assertive um, and looking for what they want in these situations. It flows through to everything when you think about what subjects to follow at school, what roles to apply for, what extracurricular activities to go after. It's it's really a, a really big issue. And I think, you know, there's there's definitely the rallying cry to all women. And, you know, this is what I say to people, whether I, you know, line manage them or mentor them or just meet in networking groups, is we have a saying, what would a dude do? Um, we always ask ourselves that if we, we've got a question, you know, and that would be apply for the job, put your hand up, take the project, figure out how you do it afterwards. Um, I think that there's definitely stuff there. But but equally, I think perhaps there's and there's something I know there's been a lot of talk around in the recruitment industry and in the HR side of businesses around. OK, well, how do we write these adverts so they're less intimidating? How do we move away from this list of requirements um, to kind of really reflect how people see these adverts and try and encourage a more diverse pool of applicants. I think there's definitely a part to play there. I, I will get onto that subject a bit later around, you know, what we can do, what companies can do to improve that. But um, some really great points around the male dominated bit there, Amy. Um, Puff, um, from your point of view, um, obviously you're, you're kind of in the more entrepreneurial space, lots of, you're in a network with lots of other agency founders and small businesses and, um, do you find that you're still one of only a few women in the room in those sort of situations? Unfortunately, yes, <laughs> which is, you know, it's not a nice position to be in. So I think one of the memories I have was from probably about four, maybe five years ago, I went to a, an agency networking event and I was, it was for um, agency owners and leaders. And it was after work, it was in London. Um, and I walked in and I was the only female and not one person, like, and I'm quite an outgoing person, right? So I'll speak to anyone. I love a good, good chat. And I purposely didn't go and speak to anyone because I wanted to see if people would come and speak to me. And I stood there for about 40 minutes no one came to speak to me no one came to like involve me in their conversations and I think it was a horrible horrible moment but equally it was a moment where I realized I never want anyone to I don't want people to feel like that like I I didn't carry on going to those particular networking events um but now when I go to networking events I will speak to other women I will speak to other men I will go and speak to people if I see someone left out it's just kindness it's just what you should do gender you know it shouldn't it just shouldn't come into the mix um I think things are changing I'm noticing the past couple of years I'm seeing more female founders I'm certainly getting to speak to a lot more of them which is awesome but I'm not sure that you know we're we're showcasing that to the kids and let me explain what I mean by that so I think and I'm probably more aware of it because I'm a mum of two daughters so obviously my daughters have it shoved down their throats that they can do anything that they want to there is no glass ceiling but when I had when I had both the girls I noticed that people like 
the first thing that people would say to the girls is, oh, aren't they pretty? Or isn't she pretty? And it was always focused on their looks. It was never how kind they were or, you know, or how well they were doing at school. Like it was, it was just always about their looks or their appearance. And then um, when my eldest daughter was, uh, had brought a reading book home from school and um, it was all about going into space. And I, and you know, it was a really great book. It was also, we had a really good time reading it together. But in the discussion after, my daughter said to me, oh no, I think I asked her, I was like, would you like to go to space? And she was like, well, I can't. And I was like, what do you mean you can't go to space? Like when you're older, of course you'll be able to go to space. And she was like, well, no, it's only boys that go to space. And I was like, what, <laughs> where did you get that from? And she was like, look, mummy, it's only boys in the book that are going to space. And you know what, I hadn't even clocked that literally every example of someone going to space was a boy. And she, and you know, at that m moment I was like, oh my gosh, like the books in school, like, and they don't mean to be, but I just don't think they're fit for purpose. And they're not about stories of entrepreneurial women or, you know, women that have, or women in tech, they're just not showcasing those examples. So whilst in the industry, I think things are changing, it's gonna be a much slower um, program, I think, to kind of get to those younger children and inspiring those younger children, because it's just every, it's society, it's the books that they read in school. It, you know, there's so many different aspects to it. Um, so I think, yes, I, it's not, there's not as many, I mean, it's definitely changing for the better, which is great, but it's not changing as quickly as I would like, or as I think it needs to. Um, and I think there's a, a few different things that we need to address there to, to change that. That is heartbreaking and so true. <laughs> um, I think uh, one of the things that gave me a metaphorical slap around the face last year, the World Economic Forum report, basically opened the headline that we will not see gender equality in our lifetimes. At current rate of progress without significant intervention from corporations, government and academic institutions, it will take 95 years for there to be gender parity in the world. And I don't know about the rest of you, but that's not good enough. So something needs to change. Um, Jen, now you come from more of the kind of traditional STEM background for a role in tech, um, which probably sees the greatest disparity in terms of male, female um, dominance. Um, from your point of view, is, is that still the case? You know, you were part of a great women returners program. Um, are, are you still seeing that um, kind of baked in imbalance in tech roles? Absolutely. But then also I want to add that it's not always been the case in tech. If you look in history, for instance, Bletchley Park, um, it used to be a female dominated industry. And, um, you know, building off of what Puff had to say as far as like um, school and perceptions and that sort of thing, women or girls in STEM needs to start at nursery. It needs to follow through through primary, secondary, all the way on up. And I think once that happens, hopefully we can bring down that 95 year, you know, disparity um, much faster. So that's about all I had to contribute there. Brilliant. So I, I think um, with the time we've got left, I think it'd be really interesting to discuss what can we do? Um, you know, I think we all three of you have shown great examples of what's possible um, in in balanced circumstances, but what can we do to affect change? You know, so, so firstly, as sort of women in positions where we've achieved a certain degree of success, have a certain degree of influence now in our organisations within society, what, what do you think are the sort of things that women can do to affect change? Amy, could we kick off with you? I think um, speak about it. You know, there's no power in silence um, on this sort of matter. And um, being young and early in my career, you know, people before me have worked far too hard for me to sit back and not have a voice. Um, I have also always been, you know, pretty outspoken and, and confident in talking to other people. And I used to get called bossy or, you know, or unkind and actually, or she's too opinionated. 
and actually no that that's not the case I wasn't bossy I was just I kind of knew what I wanted and what I wanted to get out of a situation so I questioned people and I I asked them and you know I was lucky enough that my parents always really supported that and pushed me um and I think to keep talking about that and you know and more voices um I can sit here and talk about my experience but it's going to be so different to the challenges faced by a woman of colour in the same position um, and you know that's really important to listen to so I think if we just keep talking about it and talking to the younger generations um, you know I bought uh, my niece for example a successful women book uh, and it's full of all these amazing women that have achieved something and she loves sitting and reading it and she's like four you know and if she can learn something from that I think yeah we've just got to keep talking about it and pushing it um and I think it's also important to open it out to everybody you know making sure that we have um men that are sitting and listening and are our allies and advocating for that change as well I think there is a power in numbers and it's important to spread that message and knowing that everybody is involved in this movement and everybody can make a change um I think that's important and just keep encouraging women and building them up and being kind this world is full of so many awful things all the time and people are so quick to judge and say mean things or have an opinion on somebody that isn't justified and I think why don't we all just build people up women and men and just you know create for a more a happier and kinder place um and getting people speaking and sharing their experiences and you know the world can feel pretty lonely especially when you're sat behind a computer screen so making people feel like they belong um, in whatever industry they sit in um, that's what I think thanks Amy I, I think um, the, the speaking out point is is really important um, and I think that you you did identify right this is something that you have been able to do quite naturally and you've had a very supportive uh, kind of nurture environment around being able to do that. Would you have any advice for women who are perhaps more introverted or perhaps haven't got that or perhaps are un un in the unfortunate position where they're in a company where the they don't know they're going to be backed up by allyship if they speak out? And I, I think it's, it's bold to say but do you really want to belong to a company that wouldn't let you speak out um i think have you know you've got your worth so much more than that uh, and don't take it so if you do speak out and you get a backlash then more for them because you're going to walk away and do something great at another company or start up on your own so i think it's just about having confidence and knowing that some you know a company or somewhere will accept you for being you and there's no reason to settle for any anything less and if people keep settling for less then it will take the full 95 years to get to where we need to because there's going to be a continued oppression um so yeah just be confident in yourself and, and you know if you're if you're worried speak to somebody reach out you know dm someone on linkedin and and say i'm i'm feeling this way at work and i'd love to get in into this position have you got any advice and people will advocate for you and won't stand up for you you've got an amazing team behind you um so i think yeah just know that you're not alone and i'm sure people have felt that way or felt like they haven't earned that seat at the table like i'm not going to sit here and say that i you know i haven't had imposter syndrome of course i have and when i've gone in as an account manager and they will speak to my colleague who's a male over me and direct every question to them. And it's like, hello, no, <laughs> you know, I'm, I can lead this conversation too. Um, so I think everybody will have had experiences. So it's just about confiding in people and knowing your self-worth as well. Definitely. And I think, um, yeah, never underestimate the kindness of strangers. I think that's a, that's a really good point. And, um, yeah, LinkedIn is an incredibly powerful community. There are both groups and there are women on there. And I think, you know, if anyone ever reached out to me with that situation, I'd be delighted to help them. I imagine that'd be the case with everyone on this call and probably lots of women we know uh, in that position. So yes, I guess maybe that's a rallying call, you know, ask other women for help. We're here to raise each other up. Um, Puff, um, 
you're in a position where you're sort of co-founding business so you can lead and drive a lot of change um what do you think um women can do to help accelerate this drive towards equality so i think you know any women in any woman in a position of power should lead by example so talking looking at cube and our numbers we're 48 percent female 52 percent male um which is great i think but it's not good enough um, but interestingly, at board level, we're, we've got more women than men. Um, so I'm super proud of that, but I'm very aware that that's not the case in every organization. And I think where we do have amazing examples like this, we should be shouting about them um, and we should be sharing them to help build confidence um, in women that, you know, they, they can belong in tech, they can belong in organisations like ours, for example. And I think that's important. So leading by example, um, I think, you know, it's just, it's sharing case studies, whether it's of ourselves and our experience or of others. I think, you know, to Amy's point, the more we talk about this, the more we will build confidence and the more we will encourage people to be talking about career changes or you know getting back into work if they've had a break for whatever reason um so i think yeah sharing those case studies talking about it more leading by example um you mentioned it earlier chloe in terms of recruitment there are tools out there that you can use and i can't like the name escapes me um, that can analyze your job adverts and tell you whether or not you're likely to reach more men with that advert or more women with that advert. So there are industry tools that you can use to help with your recruitment. Um, and I think, you know, using tools like that will help you um, overcome some of these barriers. Um, I think sometimes it's innate some of this bias but I think you can't there are definitely ways around that um so yeah that's my five pence worth <laughs> that, that, that's great one it's wonderful that tech is helping to drive this this change in equality by creating those sorts of tools um and I think um yeah your, your point about unconscious bias is is key and you know I think even you know the staunchest feminist has unconscious bias because everyone is a product of their environment, right? They're a product of their upbringing and their education. And um, it's something we all have to work on. You know, I know I have to work on it and uh, other people too. So it's it's definitely a, a bit like, you know, working in tech, you're always learning. It, I think as a female leader, you're always learning and having to push yourself to be better and do better because um, there's definitely that responsibility. Uh, Jen, um, what do you think? I mean, I think your story is a really great example of how you push through a lot of barriers, um, you know, and you are living proof of the change that is coming. But I guess what advice would you give to women who are looking to affect change in this space? Well, sometimes, I mean, when you look at the uh, problem, if you will, as a whole, it just seems so overwhelming. And you might ask yourself, well, you know, what, what little difference can I make there? And actually each and every person on this call can do one thing and that I've, I've got a post-it note above my monitor that reminds me every single day, lift at least one woman every day. Just do that little piece times how many people here times how many days in a year. And it, it collects, but uh, beyond that, have faith in yourself and your abilities, have faith in your team be it, you know, your partner, anybody who is, you know, in your support circle that helps support your family and that sort of thing. Have faith in school as far as, you know, wraparound care there as well. Um, be really smart about delegating the work that's on your plate. And I'm not just talking about, you know, what's in your inbox, but I'm talking about the dishes and the laundry and all that. Um, and just, you know, make up a plan and stick to it. Don't give up. Just tweak it, you know. Even if something comes up that just makes it seem so impossible to get back, recognize that it's only temporary. And there are ways to work around it. There are other ways to solve problems. Um, but a lot of that, you know, 
has to do with asking other people to get involved. And that can sometimes be really hard for women who, you know, are expected to do all this all by herself and be this, you know, powerhouse and that sort of thing, which is really tiring, let me tell you. Oh, and uh, have really good sleep hygiene. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Top tips then. I think, yeah, just, um, I think that discussion is really nicely bookended by the point Amy raised around the devil wears Prada stereotype and your point around the uh, the superwoman stereotype, uh, neither of which are terribly helpful to women, really. I, you know, I think if we're looking for true equality, you know, e equality is when, you know, a woman can show up dressed however she likes, makeup on if she wants it or not, hair however she likes, dishes done or not, and be given the same, I guess, default assumption of competence, respect, <laughs> credibility than a man would get in that same situation. I mean, especially in the tech space, you know, if you, you walk into a, a coding lab, you know, it's there, there, there's a stereotype there, right? But if a woman showed up that way, would their career prospects be the same? Probably not. Um, and I think your point about lifting each other up is really wonderful. And I know personally, the way I've progressed in my career in tech is through a mentorship. I had an amazing mentor at Microsoft who is still a really wonderful friend now. And I still speak to her regularly and equally um, female networks. Um, you know, I, I've really benefited from uh, a, lead, a group called Leading the Way, which uh, Jenny Kitchen from Yo Yo Design set up and we meet. Uh, now every month online uh, before it was like wine and dinner but now it's like wine at home and chat and I think those networks are so incredibly powerful just for sharing and I think what's really wonderful about those communities is people want to share the amount of support and knowledge you can get is huge so if you've not found your tribe yet I would say look on LinkedIn and reach out reach out to any of us here I'm sure we can uh, connect you into a tribe because they exist and they are wonderful Right, so finally, in the time we've got left, and I don't want to skimp, I know we're getting close, but, you know, as women often we go, like, what can we do? How can we affect change? And that is often the rallying cry to marginalised groups, like, well, what are you going to do about it? And here's my pushback. Tech companies, the men we work with, our allies, what are you going to do about it? What can they do about it? So, Amy, I think you're really well placed. Microsoft do a ton of work around trying to address this. So perhaps you could kind of share some of the experiences around what a tech company like Microsoft has really been doing to drive change. Yeah, so we do a few things, um, internal and external. I mean, the lineup we've got today is absolutely incredible and we've all been empowered to switch off our emails and not do any work calls today and just focus purely on International Women's Day, which is brilliant and, you know, being putting you out of office on and not being interrupted and, you know, amazing to our partner network as well I've had emails today uh, saying I know it's International Women's Day and I know you're probably busy with that so should we move our call to a different day so you know I think that's amazing events so we run a digital event where we get girls um, in year nine to come into our offices see so we can't do that at the moment um, and learn about what it is to be in a tech career we hear from um, women that are in technical roles and non-technical roles we do a bit of coding um we learn some te sales techniques and they absolutely love it i mean even being in the offices they just adore it I'm not sure whether that's the minecraft room that twists it their arm for them or you know playing with our technology but they seem like they have the best day um the fact we have uh we've now on to our second uh female ceo in a row um is amazing in the uk as well and that really helps drive um people to feel like they're empowered um, to get to that position. Uh, I think we run a community as well, um, WIT, which anyone can go on and you can join and you can be linked in with people from Microsoft and have coffee catch ups with them, whether you work there or not. And um, we also run a digital skills event, which is where we train women for free and get into coding and, you know, become um, able to do that uh, for free and not feel like they're at a disadvantage if they can't afford to or you know they feel like they're a beginner um so yeah we do a lot of things and obviously um as you said reach out to me if you um if people are listening they want to know more about what we offer at microsoft from an external basis if you're not involved internally and i can help send over those things for you oh we've also um as well <laughs> sent out uh, signed up for a free book today um 
about women in technology that we can um, get a copy of, which is great as well. Oh, that's brilliant. And uh, yeah, if you send us details, we'll um, we'll put together some show notes at the end of this with kind of any key resources. So we'll we'll include that in there, definitely. Um, Puff, as I, said, as I kind of mentioned before, like you're kind of, you're sitting both sides of the bench, you're running a tech company. So what, you know, in addition to the, the software you're using and, you know, actually your, your board representation is fantastic and your gender balance, what, what sort of things have you done or are you going to keep doing to kind of drive this change? So I think we're going to keep focusing on the numbers to make sure that we've got good representation. We've got really good strong female role models in senior positions within the business. Um, so hopefully that will continue and we can and do that. But I think it's just nurturing people. And I think it's men and women. I think, you know, educating people and supporting them is hugely important. Um, I, I have spoken to men that feel uncomfortable because they don't know what to say or do. And I think it's okay, have an honest conversation you know it's much easier it breaks down any barriers and I think the more people that are aware of it the the better or the more more quickly things will change so I think having open honest conversations with people regardless of sex gender diversity what it's regardless it's for everyone um, and it should be something that we all need to work together on I think something that I would and I actively encourage all of the team to do is network and connect with people. You know, you, you alluded to it or all, all of us have alluded to it at some point in this conversation today. But I think the more people we speak to, the more we're spreading the message and encouraging people or educating people. Um, and I think that that's not going to be a bad thing. It's going to be a good thing. and There's going to be better results. Brilliant. Um... And Jen, from your point of view, obviously you've worked, you said you kind of have the contrast of what it was like to work as a woman in tech in the 90s versus uh, returning now. Um, I guess, are you seeing a difference in what technology companies are doing? And is there anything from your experience you'd really encourage tech businesses to work on and invest in to help drive this change? Absolutely. Um, basically over at CTS, uh, we're still developing our strategies around that and continually evolve, ev evolving it. And that's mostly by um, involving women and asking them, what do you think the best solutions are? So there is a women in tech group within CTS where we're having these conversations and CTS is, has been very supportive of uh, having us go on talks such as this um, to um, discuss the issue. Um, was another point and I forgot it <laughs> but um, at any rate thank you no problem I think um, another stat I read when I was prepping for this talk is um, McKinsey did a report into sort of how uh, we can drive more quality in the tech sector um, and they said although the tech sector is really strong at investing in corporate social responsibility programs uh, only 5% of their CSR efforts and investment go to gender specific programs. So they're investing a lot uh, across in terms of like sort of talent and giving back to communities, but only 5% is going towards specifically fixing this issue. Um, and I think, unfortunately, that the notion of sort of, um, I guess, special projects and affirmative action positive discrimination, even if we go that far, has a really negative perception. Um, I think, unfortunately, it's mistakenly conflated with tokenism, which is does a disservice to everyone, and it puts the cause of marginalised groups back a lot. Um, so I, I guess, you know, my call would be up that investment, focus on women, because as per the opening point, diverse teams are more creative, innovative, and profitable to your business, which is so important when you work in the tech sector. Well, we are over time. Thank you so much, ladies, for joining me today on this very special day. Um, I really appreciate your, not only your time, but your candor and your contribution to this topic. Um, I could talk to you for another, well, I could probably keep on talking to you guys about this for the rest of the day, but unfortunately we've all got jobs to do. 
which is amazing. <laughs> so um, thank you and let's keep fighting the good fight.